downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. I'm Lloyd Anderson, president of City Club. Welcome to our very special program today. Our focus today is the state and its future with Governor John Kitzhaber and his annual State of the State Address. On Friday, January the 28th, join us once again for Mayor Vera Katz's State of the City Address. Over 200 people have already pre-registered for this program, so if you wish to attend and don't have your reservations yet, please make them uh, on the club's reservation line this afternoon or over the weekend. If you uh, had parking problems today, you will have another opportunity next week. Uh, my suggestion is that you take Max, uh, uh, which I think serves from downtown about every 10 minutes. Next week uh, is also a special program because we will be awarding the City Club Award to the longtime City Club member and past president, Don Sterling. The City Club Award is, is for a club member who has made an outstanding contribution both to the club and to the community. It's the highest honor we can bestow, bestow on any of our members. Our board host today is Harriet Watson, president-elect of the City Club and director of public affairs for Reed College. She will ask the first question. Following Harriet's question, we will open up program, uh, pro, uh, the program to questions from City Club members uh, here in the audience. The microphones are here uh, on my left, uh, so please uh, make your questions to the point and brief. And today you'll see the harsh administration at work if it lasts over 30 seconds. <laughs> Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Barney and Worth, Kaiser Permanente Health Systems, Wells Fargo Bank. We're very grateful for their support. John Kitzhaber was our last governor of the 20th century, and whether you measure the turn of the century as this year or next, he will be our first governor of the 21st century. During his tenure, the state has been, had one of the longest periods of sustained economic growth in our history. Under his leadership as president of the Senate and as governor, we've seen major improvements in health care coverage for our lower income families. He received the prestigious Newberger Award from the Oregon Environmental Council for his environmental stewardship. His welfare reform plan has had a dramatic effect on reducing the welfare caseload and helping some 20,000 Oregonians get back to work but he's faced problems that don't go away. The shift of financing for schools from local to state sources, transportation funding, the uneven nature of the economic boom, to name a few. All that and a state surplus. How lucky can we get? And the job hasn't been made easier by partisan difficulties of a Republican-run legislature and a Democratic governor along with referend enough referendums and initiatives to make any voter's head swim. But problems can be opportunities also. John Kitzhaber was first elected to office as a state representative from Roseburg in 1978, and after serving two years in that body, he was elected to the state senate and, and served as president in that body from 1985 until he was elected governor in 94. John is in the second year of his, of his second term. Please welcome John Kitzhaber. Governor.
Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for this opportunity to address the Portland City Club again. Today I'd like to talk to you about Oregon's future. And in particular, I want to talk about two of the most central challenges facing us as we enter this new century. The quality of our system of public education and increasing the number of Oregonians who have access to health care. Beyond that, however, I'd like to discuss a larger and perhaps more fundamental question as a way of providing some context for these specific challenges. Because I have some very deep concerns about the future of our state that are fostered, ironically, by the very prosperity and quality of life with which we enter the 21st century. To quote Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I think these opening lines from A Tale of Two Cities aptly describes our state in the year 2000. It's the best of times because our economy is so good. We've got record low unemployment rates. There is no crisis on the horizon to command public attention. There's no sense of urgency. And at the same time, we continue to enjoy this incredible quality of life, from our public beaches to the Cascades to the high desert, from Mount Hood in the Columbia Basin to the valley to the Rogue River. It's the worst of times because this very prosperity has created a kind of complacency, one that I fear is masking our need not only for each other, but also for our government that provides for us those things that we can't provide for ourselves as individuals. It's a subtle thing, but it's one that I think can have a profound impact and a long-lasting impact on this state of ours. When we talk about Oregon's greatness, what do we talk about? We always talk about our public beaches. And we talk about our land use planning program that has preserved farm and forest land and open spaces and has given this state more options on how we grow and develop than probably any other state in America. And we talk about our bottle bill. And we talk about our park system. And all these things are indeed a part of the Oregon heritage, part of the Oregon ethic. The Oregon mystique, as McCall referred to it. It's a spirit of community building, and it's a spirit of protecting this special place, this home of ours. And it's a spirit and an ethic that has defined us as much as the powerful landscapes that surround us. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose it for myself. I don't want to lose it for my family. And I especially don't want to lose it for my son. And I don't think anyone wants to lose it. It's part of who we are. It's why we came to this state, and it's why we stay here. But consider this. Since 1990, we have welcomed almost 500,000 new Oregonians. And since 1975, we have welcomed over a million. In other words, nearly a third of our population arrived here or were born here after these things that we cherish and point to had been put in place after responsible civic involvement and leadership by both the public and private sector and progressive action by the Oregon State Legislature had actually created this very heritage that we now point to with such pride. We tend to assume that all Oregonians share in this ethic of community responsibility and civic action and environmental stewardship. And I'm not sure that we can make that assumption today. For people who moved into it, and for many people who were born into it, I think it's very easy to take for granted the gifts that we have here in this state. For people who didn't have to fight for these things and didn't have to struggle for these things, it is easy to undervalue what we have here in the state of Oregon. My father, for example, and I know there are people in this room like him, was a child of the Great Depression. When he was 16, he was going to high school and working six hours a day, seven days a week for 12 and a half cents an hour to help pay the family rent. He served in World War II. He got a college degree on the GI Bill. He became a university professor and he retired after a successful teaching career at the University of Oregon. And to this day, he still values and appreciates what he has far more than many members of my generation. The point is that this Oregon ethic this heritage to which we point so proudly, this quality of life that we enjoy, <clears throat> this booming economy didn't just happen. It doesn't come with the land and the air in this place. It's not inherent in this place, although I think the place tended to 
inspire some of it. The fact is that these things that we cherish about the state of Oregon have got to be constantly renewed in ourselves and in our community. And bringing our citizens to understand that fact is, to me, one of the greatest challenges we face in the year 2000. Bringing them to see that if we continue to do no more than point to this heritage that has been created by somebody else and don't do anything ourselves to renew it for future generations, then we run a very real risk of having both our good economy and our quality of life slip from our grasp. There are many words, I think, to describe this, this challenge, this commitment to do what is necessary to make sure that what is good about Oregon remains good. One of those words is sustainability. Now, many of you may know that I will be issuing an executive order in March to try to make the state government a leader in the fight to sustain our quality of life and our environment in the face of a growing population. And what I'm suggesting to you today is that the same kind of effort and the same level of commitment will also be needed to sustain the other things that we value about the state of Oregon, one of which is our system of public education. Public education is the cornerstone of a progressive democratic society. And when I talk about public education, I'm referring to the entire educational continuum from kindergarten to post-secondary education to lifelong learning. We're not going to build a 21st century economy in Oregon with high school graduates alone. And that means that this community, as well as communities around the state of Oregon, has got to expand its vocal support for education beyond primary and secondary schools, as important as they are, to also include our post-secondary system as well. From grade school to grad school, we've got to be willing to do more than simply pay lip service to quality education. We need to back that rhetoric with action. So let's start with K through 12. As you probably know, uh, along with State Superintendent of Public Instruction Stan Bunn and Standard Insurance President Ron Tempe, I have filed two initiative positions to deal with the questions of stability and equity and adequacy of the funding for our schools. The first measure, the Stability and School Funding Act, will create a fund to maintain our school budgets during an economic downturn. Now, we all know that one of these days our economy is going to slow, and we can't simply afford to stop educating a generation of Oregonians because of a fluctuation in our economy. So this fund will be capitalized with four existing sources of revenue, 15 percent of lottery proceeds that are currently going to the Education Endowment Fund, 25 percent of the National Tobacco Settlement, interest earnings from the Common School Fund, and half of any future surplus tax revenues with the other half being rebated. Now I can tell you that there will be those who will argue about how we are planning to capitalize this fund, but I challenge anyone to make the argument that we don't need financial reserves for perhaps the single most important public service we provide, educating the next generation of Oregonians. Now the second measure, the Accountability and Equity in School Funding Act does two things. First, it ensures that quality education is not an accident of geography in Oregon by correcting a serious problem with the local option law passed by the recent legislature. By requiring the legislature to equalize the revenue generated between property poor and property rich districts, it will ensure that students in Coos Bay or Fossil have the same educational opportunities as students in Beaverton or Lake Oswego. Second, the measure constitutionally requires the legislature to provide funding adequate to meet the quality education goals established in law and to explain how the legislatively adopted budget meets those goals. In other words, it's about accountability. It will shift the K-12 funding debate in Salem from one that centers around these large abstract numbers to a debate about what we want those dollars to achieve in the classroom in order to advance the objectives of the Education Act for the 21st century. Both of these initiatives will be ready for signature gathering next week, and I ask for your active support not only to get these issues before the voters, but to ensure their passage in the November general election. I will also be forwarding two proposals to help improve the training and the development of Oregon teachers. The first proposal aims at increasing the number of Oregon teachers certified by the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. Where are you from? 
This, as you know, is a highly respected certification process that results in better trained teachers who will be a resource not only for our children, but also for other members of their own profession. To accomplish that, my next budget will provide funding sufficient to pay for the certification of 500 Oregon teachers by the year 2003. And I also propose that the teachers will receive a salary bonus if they successfully complete this certification. The second proposal addresses the growing problem of teacher retention. Now nationally, only 20% of teachers who enter their first year in the classroom are still there after five years. In urban school districts, close to half of the new teachers leave during the first five years. Now for many of them, this exodus reflects the fact that they didn't get the support they needed during the difficult transition from being students to being classroom teachers. So my next budget, I will propose funding a mentor program, or actually restarting the mentor program that we once had in this state, that will allow school districts to use some of the time of their best and most experienced teachers to help new teachers transition into the classroom. Now this will not only make for better trained teachers, but it will also help us reap the benefits of the substantial investment we as a society are currently make, making in teacher training. Now finally, just as we invest in our teachers, so must we invest in our school buildings themselves. This state has a staggering accumulation of capital construction and deferred maintenance needs in its schools, colleges, and universities. So to address this, I will propose a state-backed bond fund for capital construction and maintenance. We can't continue to provide quality education in a crumbling, deteriorating infrastructure, and we cannot accommodate enrollment growth and reduce class sizes without new capital construction. This proposal will address both issues. Now, in addition to these investments in our primary and secondary system, we must also invest in our universities and community colleges. First, we must help Oregon's community colleges serve the growing number of students who are looking to the community colleges for their education. For many Oregonians, our community colleges are the front door to better jobs and to better, better futures. They serve not only as the community resource needed for professionals to keep their skills up to date, but for many, they were the first step towards a four-year degree. Yet, the last legislative session provided no increase to cover the dramatic enrollment growth faced by our community colleges, and that's not acceptable. So my next budget will include resources to begin to address the increasing enrollment challenges at these vital centers of learning throughout the state of Oregon. Second, I propose that we move aggressively to expand geographic access to four-year degrees throughout the state. Central Oregon Community College, both because it lies in the area's fastest growing region and because it is already offering some expanded courses, is the logical place to begin this bold effort. Now, in a different era, we might simply move to create the University of Central Oregon. But today, in an era of fiscal limits, we can and must choose a different path, taking advantage of the Oregon University System's University Center, which brokers four-year degrees and which has been operating in Bend since 1995. Last year, through that program, 100 students in Central Oregon received degrees from six different institutions without having to leave the campus of Central Oregon Community College. I believe that using satellite-based instruction and the internet, coupled with a very strong community college president and solid community support, that we should be able to quadruple that number. So to advance this cause, I will be directing the Oregon Board of Higher Education to develop a proposal and a budget to build on this partnership and to expand on a permanent and stable basis four-year degree offerings at Central Oregon Community College as a prototype for other community colleges throughout the state of Oregon. Third, I believe that our university system must expand its technology offerings to meet the demand of these disciplines in the future. In the last century, Oregon invested heavily in its schools of agriculture and forestry, the mainstays of our economy. Today, while still offering support to these important traditional natural resource-based industries, we need to make a similar commitment to the economic mainstay of the 21st century, and that is technology. Therefore, I will propose a program that will both double engineering graduates from Oregon institutions in the next five years and create a tier one engineering school within the borders of the state by the year 2010. As a part of this effort, I will expect a substantial contribution from the Oregon's high technology industry 
to match our public commitment to this objective. But let me add that our technology future is not electronics alone, and I will therefore ask the Oregon Board of Higher Education to examine how Oregon can take advantage of the growing bioscience sector as an integral part of our economic base in the future. Now, one more thing on the education front. I want to ask uh, all of you to join me the week of April 24th, 28th, to go back to school. Uh, I'm going to be uh, heading back to spend some time in the classroom, hopefully at uh, my alma mater, South Eugene High School, if they're willing to overlook the decidedly pedestrian GPA that I carried away with my <laughs> diploma. The fact is that more than 75% of Oregonians don't have any children in our public school system yet they have a vital interest in ensuring that we successfully educate the next generation of students. And I'm convinced that the simple act of seeing the state of our schools, looking at their physical conditions, seeing the challenges faced by our teachers, and learning about the new academic standards that we're demanding of our children will create a larger base of support for the enterprise of public education. And I applaud this effort, and I would like uh, our, one of the founders of this effort, which is called the State Organization for Schools, Denise Frisbee, to stand, if you are here, Denise. <laughs> I want to thank both you and Don for the hard work you've made on this, on this very, very important effort. And I think if anyone here wants to learn more about the State Organization uh, for Schools, uh, I'm sure Denise will be glad to accommodate you. And I look forward to seeing a lot of people participate around the state uh, in April. Now, as we move forward to meet the challenge of educating our citizens, we also may need to make a similar commitment to their health care. Oregon has been a national leader in this area with the development and implementation of the Oregon Health Plan. We set out to assure access to a basic level of care for all of our citizens, and we have made significant progress towards that objective. We've lowered the percentage of Oregonians without health insurance coverage from 18% in 1994 to 10% today. And in children, this progress has been even more dramatic, moving from 21% uninsured to just over 7%. Yet in spite of this progress, one out of 10 Oregonians, 300,000 people still doesn't have access to health care, and over 66,000 of those are children. And that is just indefensible, particularly with this economy. We have been able to provide this health care under the Oregon Health Plan at a significantly low cost. The Oregon Health Plan is one of the cheapest plans in the country. Expenditure growth under the Oregon Health Plan has been 22% less than the growth of health expenditures nationally. So today I ask you to rejoin me in recommitting ourselves to making Oregon the first state in the country with universal coverage for health insurance. Now, why is this important? Well, first, it's important because it's the right thing to do. The fact is that people without insurance receive less care than people with insurance. They receive that care late, and they are four times more likely to require hospitalization or emergency care. Second, because the increasing costs of health care threatens all of us. This is not just a problem unique to the Oregon Health Plan, as some members of the legislature would lead us to believe. This is a challenge that's facing both the public and private sector. And we cannot control overall costs in the system as long as there is a large segment of population who doesn't have health insurance coverage. Why? Because people without coverage in this state and in this country ultimately get care. When they get sick enough, they go to the emergency room where they are treated in one of the most expensive care settings late in the course of their illness, but outcomes are worse and costs are higher. And those costs are simply shifted back through the system and are reflected in increased premiums being experienced by individuals and by businesses and by, uh, and by, and by government. And that's one of the reasons that private sector health insurance premium rates today are going up 12 to 20 percent a year, and that is clearly not sustainable over time. So what I will be proposing to the 2001 legislature will address not only the uninsured, but also the entire tr structure of our health care system. And while it's beyond the scope of this address today to go into the details of my proposal, it will be based on the following principles. First, we must move towards universal coverage. Second, the government must define the floor, that is the basic minimum level of care that we're going to offer to all of our citizens. 
Third, because some individuals can't afford the cost of care, the government must provide some subsidies to make insurance affordable to all of our citizens. Fourth, all subsidies must be explicit, and public subsidies must be based on ability to pay and restricted to the cost of purchasing the basic level of care. And fourth, the responsibility of business, governments, and individuals must be clearly and explicitly defined. Now, in addition to these guiding principles, the proposal will make use of the state's purchasing power as a major buyer of health care, hopefully in collaboration with major private sector purchasers, to target and reduce runaway costs such as prescription drugs. Oregon is uniquely qualified to develop this kind of a proposal. Our experience in dealing with the fiscal limits of health care and of setting priorities gives us both the knowledge and the discipline to once again lead the nation. To build the public support needed for this proposal to become a reality, I will ask the Oregon Health Council to conduct a series of town hall meetings on this issue where these concepts can be debated and discussed throughout the state. In addition, I will convene an Oregon Health Policy Summit to discuss these issues with legislative leaders and other public and private sector leadership throughout the state of Oregon. And the recommendations flowing from these efforts will form the basis for legislation that I will bring to the 2001 session. But for any of these efforts to go forward, it is imperative that we defeat Bill Sizemore's initiative to remove the cap on deductibility of federal income tax. If this, if this measure is passed, it will amount to a $1.6 billion revenue reduction in the next biennial budget. That is 15% of the general fund. Even worse, it is retroactive. It takes effect January 1st of this year, which mean, means we will be facing a billion dollar deficit in the current biennial budget, all of it coming in the last quarter. And if we let this happen, if we let this happen, Reflect for a moment about what that says about our priorities and our values as Oregonians. I mean, do we really believe that our schools have 15% more than they need to educate the next generation of Oregonians? Is it acceptable to us that 66,000 children in this booming economy are without financial access to health care? Do we want to simply stop investing in our environment, walk away from children at risk, stop putting money in our infrastructure? That's not a part of the Oregon heritage. That is not a part of the Oregon ethic, and it should not be a part of Oregon's future, and I will debate Mr. Sizemore on exactly those points. <laughs> My friends, the challenge that we face today goes far beyond the specific issues of educating our children or expanding health care. Or, or sustaining our environment. And it transcends our efforts to finance our transportation system and to reduce juvenile crime and to maintain a strong economy. Our challenge lies in the growing public disconnect between the vision of a livable, prosperous Oregon on the one hand and the investments and personal effort it takes to reach that and keep that on the other. And if we cannot move Oregonians to address this challenge, then we stand to lose a great deal in this state of ours. And again, our very success makes this challenge more difficult. It's like the challenge I face as a physician, trying to make the case that if you drink too much and smoke too much and eat a high-fat diet and don't exercise, you're going to have some heart problems down the road. Well, try making that case to a 21-year-old college student who takes his health for granted. Likewise, those of us in Oregon who are lucky enough to live here, have been enjoying this good economy and this exceptional quality of life for so long that I think we're taking it for granted. And I think we believe that we really don't have to do anything to make sure that we retain what we have here. But all of the prosperity in the world is not going to protect the quality of life in this state if we don't have a common vision for Oregon and a common commitment to sustain it. In the final analysis, we need each other a lot more than we need our parochial concerns. And what we need desperately in this state is a victory for community over self-interest, and that starts right here in this room. This isn't just a question of what we can expect from our government. 
This is a question of what we are willing to demand of ourselves. Both long-term and new Oregonians need to come together in common cause to secure the future of this state. There are simply too many people on the sidelines. Our voter turnouts are dismal. It's been said that we should be interested in the future because we'll spend the rest of our lives there. Well, that is a message that's particularly valid for our younger voters. Yet in last year's primary, 6% of people 18 to 34 showed up to vote. 6% while every day the future they're going to be living in is being decided without them, ballot measure by ballot measure, legislature by legislature, and that is not a formula for a sustainable Oregon. Your job and mine this year is no less than to rekindle both the spirit and the consensus that has marked this state's proud past. It's a vision and commitment that has given us an unparalleled quality of life and a tremendous economy and more choices than any other state in the Union. We need to recommit ourselves to that vision and to assume our responsibilities in making sure it moves towards its full potential. So the question before us today is larger than whether we can sustain our quality of life and whether we can maintain our economy. The question is whether we are willing to invest the time and energy to rebuild the Oregon community, because the answer to the first question hinges on the answer to the second. It has less to do with government than it does with commitment to place. And as I said, if we do no more than continue to point proudly to a heritage that someone else created without making the commitment ourselves to sustain that heritage and that ethic for future generations, then surely we have forsaken our roots and we have forgotten what it means to be an Oregonian. We cannot let this state slip from our grasp, and I call on each and every one of you to reject that path and to reclaim Oregon for ourselves and for our future. Let me close with a quote from Wallace Stegner in a small book called The Sound of Mountain Water. Now, he wrote this about the West in general, but I think it, as much as anything, frames the challenge that we face as the Oregon community in the year 2000, and it reads, one cannot be pessimistic about the West. This is the native home of hope. When it fully learns that cooperation, not rugged individualism, is the quality that most characterizes and preserves it, then it will have achieved itself and outlived its origins. Then it has a chance to build a society to match its scenery. No less than that is our goal. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Hit Kitzhaber. It's my privilege to ask the first question this afternoon. As you might already know, the City Club has recently charged a new research study on charter schools. Where do charter schools fit into your education program? Uh, I think charter schools have an important role to play. Uh, the debate that we've had in this state, I think, is how you define charter schools. Uh, I signed a bill this session uh, that I believe fits the parameters that at least um, are, are, are my, dis my uh, definition. To me, a charter school is not an end run of the public school system. It doesn't pull resources from, from the public school system. It doesn't skim students, um, the best and brightest, from the public school system and leave those who are disadvantaged. Uh, and it still has to uh, meet the objectives of the Education Act for the 21st century. To the extent that charter schools can provide an opportunity for innovation and creation and more parental involvement in, in, in the school uh, uh, system and in the enterprise of learning, then I think they have a very important role to play. And, and we are seeing some crop up around the state of Oregon, and I'm very excited about it.
corporate responsibility for restoring Cameron Watershed. And you said very strongly, I think, that, that, that you see that not getting one out of the things like the planner and the are they all basis for building the investment. Um, and it also complements our financial land planning very well. My question is, how do you see the, this approach being adapted to the urban areas? And how do we, how do we really take a watershed approach but still address the unique pressures urban development puts on It's a great question, and I and I think it's important to point out that that when we let's just let's just take water quality as a, as an example, because to me, you know, sort of fish uh, restoration to ex an extent is is part of the larger issue of maintaining the quality of our watersheds. You know, you can't solve the Willamette River water quality problems uh, on the backs of agriculture and forestry alone. You could eliminate timber harvest in the valley. You could close down agriculture. And if you didn't do something about the non-point source pollution load, the runoff load that comes out of Portland, Eugene, and Salem, and Albany, you haven't got over the bar. So your question is a very, very good one, and it's a very difficult one. Um, I um, woke up one night and woke my wife up and, and uh, explained to her my concept of uh, the urban watershed, <laughs> which involved a map, which I presented to her at 2 in the morning, that showed the discharge points into the Willamette Valley and all into the Willamette from Portland, all the little capillaries and arteries that extend up to your sewer drain. And I thought you could sort of draw a circle around that and then measure the pollutants coming out of the pipe and then have a contest in the neighborhood to kind of do things to reduce the discharge into the Willamette, thus the urban watershed based on storm sewers. Not an exciting idea as I discovered at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> But I think uh, one of the challenges of the Willamette Restoration Initiative that uh, Dr. Paul Risser, the president of OSU, is working on is exactly that. And, and really what it involves is strategies that somehow get individual citizens to be more aware of and take more personal responsibility for their daily actions um, and the relationship between those and uh, the watershed. For example, making a decision not to wash your car with detergent in your driveway, what you, put, you know, what you put on the lawn, what you put on the roof to deal with, uh, with, with moss. So I know there's some efforts in Oregon, uh, in, in, in the Portland area, uh, aimed at that, but we must have, have a much broader and more vigorous uh, outreach program to engage Oregonians and give them specific things they can do in their own daily lives. And, and I think that uh, that does two things. I think it will ultimately be a very good complement to what's happening in rural Oregon, but it does build community. Uh, one of the great success stories of these rural watershed councils is you get agriculturalists and farmers and environmentalists and folks who used to lob briefs at each other in the courtroom going out there and actually doing things in the watershed. And it gives us a, you know, I think it gives us a, a vision of something we have I I in common. So more of that, and Dr. Rister will be issuing a report, I believe, around March with, I think, some specific recommendations on how we approach this in an urban setting. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, Matteo Lucio, City Club member. The uh, issue of the cap on uh, the amount of federal income tax that we can deduct from uh, state income tax is not just a matter of total, or the total amount of uh, money that we collect here. It also goes to the issue of progressivity. Without that, as I understand it, the Oregon income tax would be rather flat. Bill Sizemore knows that very well, and I believe he's, uh, he's attacking the principle of progressivity together with trying to uh, d defund our state government. Uh, w would you comment on that, and, and, will, and do you plan to address that basic principle of progressivity in your debates with uh, Bill Sizemore? Well, I'm sure it'll come up. Uh, I mean, obviously, it, if, you, if you think about it, it, it does move. Uh, it, it's basically, I mean, the way I would put it is it's a disinvestment, and it's a, it's, a, it's a transfer from a social investment in education and public safety and health care, the other things we use the general fund for, to those at the upper end of the income scale, because obviously they have more to deduct. Uh, and that does reduce the progressivity of the system. And I think, uh, I think it's a, a bad measure on that basis alone. I think we can have a, 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 a reasonable argument about whether or not the Oregon income tax is too high. I mean, I think it's too high. Uh, but, the, but the issue is, A, if you're going to change it, is progressivity important? And secondly, what is the impact of that? And I, I just have to take this opportunity to drive home one point about this ballot measure. Even if there's a little part of you that thinks this is a good idea long term and the impacts are next biennium, this goes into effect January 1st of this year, and that means that it'll, if it passes in November, the day after the election, we will have about $3 billion left in the general fund. We will have a $1 billion hole. Now that's 30%. That's schools, universities, public safety, prisons, 
health care, right across the board. And if I called a special session and actually got a lame duck legislature to give me three-fourths vote in both houses for an income tax increase or a surcharge, it can't go into effect for 90 days because you can't put the emergency clause on it. So we're going to run into a very, very serious fiscal crisis in this state. And, I, you know, it just seems to me that, that with the economy so good and everything going so well, to put that kind of a speed bump in the ability to make any kind of long-range planning or investment in education or business is madness. Madness. Governor Steve Novick, City Club member. Governor, the people in this room... I know you. <laughs> <laughs> the people in this room and in our radio audience are among the most generous people in the state. They give to universities, they give to schools, they give to human service agencies. But no amount of charitable giving is going to make up for the devastation that will be wrought if Mr. Sizemore's windfall for the wealthy passes. Unfortunately, it will take a serious campaign to beat that measure because the ballot title isn't going to tell voters what the consequences are. Would you agree that this year, instead of or in addition to charitable giving, Oregonians need to consider giving hard cash to the campaign against Sizemore's measure? <laughs> yes. Kirk Krause, City Club. Um, Governor, currently the City Club Technology and Business Committee is, uh, is researching and preparing an information report dealing with sustainability. And we certainly commend your new stand on sustainability. But the question we have is what steps do you plan to take to put teeth into your executive order and what leadership role do you plan to play in, um, in achieving results? The, um, the executive order, <clears throat> we're currently drafting it and we're hoping to be able to get it completed sometime in March to roughly, roughly correspond with the issuance of the uh, State of the Environment, Oregon State of the Environment report. We're going to put, uh, this will be centered in the Department of Administrative Services. Our current director, John Yunker, uh, has uh, decided to retire just before this. Uh, uh, wave your hand, John. Yeah, good. That's right. uh, the D Department of Administrative Services, the executive branch, will spearhead this. We will have some people inside that department who will put state government through something similar to the natural step that the private sector does to essentially look at. Um, Purchasing policies, you know, the fact that we're both a, we're, we're a big developer, we manage forests and rangelands, we pave roads, we buy reams of paper, to, to basically try to develop some parameters and some benchmarks for agencies to, to, to move in that direction. There are some things going on. They haven't been very well, I think, celebrated or advertised, so we're not starting from zero. Uh, but the executive order will be, uh, will outline that and, and, and as well as some specific targets for, for, for agencies. And then in, in terms of my role, I will be I meet uh, every week with my, with my cabinet uh, members, and uh, they know this is on the agenda, and we'll be working together to try to make this happen. And I want you to know that the state agency heads are pretty excited about this. I mean, they don't know quite what it's going to look like, but they're committed to the overall concept. Milt Markwood, City Club member. Um, in your speech, you, you alluded to the fact that, that what transcends everything in terms of education and, and uh, and the health care and so forth is the idea that we should have a shared vision. And uh, it has always been my understanding that the Progress Board was pretty much the keeper of that vision and the facilitator for getting it. Um, and in my work with the Progress Board some years ago, I always heard, no matter what was going on, in the end it said, in order to achieve these goals, the civ civility that we wanted, the sustainability that we might want, whatever, we must have an excellent education system. And yet I've never seen the goals that have been established by the uh, Progress Board as being directly tied to education. And I wonder, is any work being done in this area, or would you want um, to uh, maybe you know, go after that a little harder? The, the, uh, bench for the, the Oregon Progress Board uh, and, uh, <clears throat> has been in the process, first of all, the last few years of reducing the number of benchmarks. We had there were so many benchmarks, I mean, you know, that, that, that they really were sort of, they weren't really very meaningful. So we've reduced it to 100, and the idea is to try to quantify those benchmarks and then to tie them into the budgeting process so that we have actual targets to shoot at. Um, you know, the benchmarks, of course, uh, are, are, uh, in, are only valid to the extent that we can actually get those budgets approved. So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the Progress Board, uh, and if you read the vision, 
in Oregon Shines, the document that Governor Goldschmidt put together, and, and then our subsequent one, you will find a very clearly stated vision that I don't think anyone dis disagrees with. The broken link is this one. They described what was called the circle of prosperity, where you invested in education uh, that created a well-trained workforce, the best in the nation by this year and best in the world by 2000, that would create economic activity, that would create revenues that you could re- uh, invest in education and social services. Well, here's what we've done. We've cut that link. We did the we've done the first part. We're educating a workforce, and, and we're going to continue to work on that. But the revenues that we have generated haven't been reinvested back into our basic infrastructure, either physical or personal. We rebate it through the kicker, and we refuse to recognize that you can't uh, continue to patch potholes. So I, I would argue that the, big, the biggest disconnect isn't the vision itself or the benchmarks, it's the fact that we have somehow turned a blind eye to one of the fundamental principles of, of the Oregon vision. And it is the same principle that everyone from Intel to Roseburg Lumber uses to be successful in the economy. You don't ignore your physical plant, you don't ignore your workforce. And I think we as a society have to kind of come back to that and step up to that and recognize that connection. Winnie Kane, City Club member. Uh, I'm wondering how the education initiatives that you talked about today uh, apply to charter schools, and if they don't apply to charter schools, are you planning to <coughs> propose any initiatives that would ensure the quality of education for charter school members? Well, the charter schools right now uh, have to be essentially approved within the public school system by the local school board. So they're not an, an independent entity out there, and the, and the resources they get are the resources we get through our public school system. One of the points of debate about the charter school bill in the last session is people, so there was a group of people who would argue that the charter school is really outside of the public school system, and it can take resources away from the public school system. And obviously one of the concerns is sort of like vouchers. You are concerned that you drain resources away and you're left with fewer resources to take care of a large group of people who don't happen to be in charter schools. So the, the funding that we have, any funding we get for K through 12 is, is essentially available for charter schools. It, it simply has to go through the, the, the process we've set up that does involve the local school boards. I'm going to bow to the gentleman who's been in line here much longer than I have. Uh, hello, Governor. My name is Pavel Goberman, City Club member. You do a very good job in healthcare. Uh, uh, so many people will appreciate uh, this. Uh, I think Clinton administration has to take example from uh, your movement. Uh, my, but at the same time, the uh, state has uh, some problem. Um, yeah, I, I think about healthcare plan. I think we have to start something new. People who want public assistance, who has medical problem, have have obligation have must have obligation before taxpayers participate participate in organized fitness activities, except a few doctors doctors have problems. But at the same time, I think you did some mistake in your job. But destroy Carissa. I, it could be safe, ship, I call it, con I have experience, contact at your office, no reply. About education, we have to improve quality of education. Children do pay attention, homework, it's first. More homework. Uh, and uh, what I want to say, uh, Spanish, Spanish language, why? In uh, many state ag agencies, uh, Spanish language is first I language. I think they came here, they have to speak English. So why oh, this at um, uh, I, I think it has to be corrected. W uh, there my question is, why uh, state pay attention to much sp uh, Spanish language in state offices? Um, if I, uh, let me try to answer part of your question. And um, where is someone from my staff? Uh, Danny, just if you, Danny will give you his card, and we can we can talk more okay. about the issue with the office. Let me try to answer your question. As I understand it, uh, it's an access issue, and, and and if I'm missing this, we can I will try to get get the get the answer. We've got a lot of people who are below the federal poverty level who essentially are eligible for the Oregon Health Plan, but the point is that universal coverage is not synonymous with universal access. 
the biggest barrier to access is financial, but there are also cultural barriers, language barriers, lack of daycare, geographic barriers, dis maldistribution of physicians and hospitals. So one of the things that we're trying to do in the debate before the last e-board was trying to maintain funding for several outreach programs. One was to try to reach street kids in Portland who are eligible for the health plan but don't know about it. One was targeted in Medford at, his, at the Hispanic population who, 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 who don't know about it. Uh, and uh, we had another one for, for rural young people. So I think part of reaching universal coverage involves dealing with other access issues besides just uh, financial ones, and I think that's the language barrier is a hugely significant one given the increased diversity of Oregon, particularly among our, our uh, growing Hispanic population. Paul Milius, City Club member. Um, if I remember what I've read in the media properly, we are either at this time or about to be spending more money on prisons than we are on higher education. Do your education initiatives <coughs> call for any kind of programs to mitigate the impact of Measure 11 in terms of having to build more prison beds, having to devote more resources to it, as opposed to perhaps looking at alternatives for community corrections, electronic monitoring of, monitoring of nonviolent offenders, and so on, that might help us get more money uh, shifted away from prisons into the education fund. Um, the, uh, there's a couple of things. Some we've done, some in the progress is doing. When I was elected in 94, we uh, we, I got Measure 11 along. You got Measure 11 along with me. Uh, and uh, we, we created something called the Community uh, Partnership Act. Uh, 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 Ted Kulingowski, now Justice on the Supreme Court, then Attorney General, was one of the people that helped craft this, uh, who's with us here today. And essentially it takes those felons who are sentenced to less than 12 months, many of whom were getting into the prison system and sort of cycling through and sort of leaving before, before they ever really got any kind of treatment and move those down to the community level where there's a wide range of sanctions from electronic monitoring to a whole host of other things as well as some treatment dollars. So we are, we are working on the ad end of it. The juvenile crime prevention package that we got through last session really targets both at-risk youth, these kids who are about ready to tip over into a Measure 11 offense to try to pull them back, as well as front-end dollars on things like Healthy Start and real, real primary prevention. We need to do more of that and we need better funding on that end. Finally, I think Measure 11, I didn't vote for it, uh, I do believe there are certain sentences, certain crimes that are so heinous that, that people just need to be locked up and have the key thrown away. But in that mix of sentences in that measure are some totally unreasonable uh, and uh, disproportionate sentences. And I do believe that we need to go in and make some responsible modifications to ballot measure 11. And uh, we can do that legislatively. You need, I believe, a two-thirds vote. I believe there's also a ballot measure to repeal it. So there'll be a question on the, on the ballot. And I think the legislature <clears throat> has the opportunity to make some responsible choices within that with good public debate that would, I think, uh, significantly reduce the cost and also help out some of the kids. Governor <clears throat> Kitzhopper, Jay Formick, Oregon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, City Club member. In your uh, endorsement of the former Senator Bill Bradbury for the Democratic nomination for president, you struck an interesting note regarding the uh, use of the federal uh, hydroelectric system in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously, you're on record uh, supporting the region taking control of it, notwithstanding Governor Locke's position. You're pursuing that, I, I understand. Uh, the note that you struck seemed to suggest doubt about the veracity of keeping the four lower Snake River dams. I want to try to flush you out on this. Is it time? <laughs> To take, so to speak. <laughs> is it time to take those dams down? Uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me see if I can give you a real dynamite answer to that question. I think we need to make a distinction. Uh, and I want to I say this real clearly because this is an important issue that's going to get hotter and hotter in the Northwest, and it, and it is a very serious issue. Uh, the science suggests that a free-flowing river is better for fish. Now, I mean, I, I don't think that's too surprising. I mean, uh, if, it's like, uh, would, you, could you, was it e would it be easier to walk across the street if you could just walk across a crosswalk or have to climb over a school bus? I mean, it's, but, the, but, but the, the question, the other part of the question that people don't answer is, that's not the same as saying taking out the dams will recover the fish. And that's the key point. The issue here isn't just making things better for fish, it's recovering those salmon runs. I do not believe that dam breaching alone will recover the, the Columbia River salmon, period. Uh, I do believe that there are both breaching and non-breaching alternatives. And that if you do breach, 
you probably don't need to do as much in the area of habitat or harvest reductions or hatchery modifications. If you don't breach the dams, you probably have to do more. My objective, working with the Power Council and their multi-species framework process that they'll be coming up with fairly soon, is to try to lay those options in front of us. Because what we have gotten into is a debate about symbols. The dams are symbols. They are, on the environmental side, they're symbols of man's subjugation of this great waterway. And if we take them away, we win, and we get some points on our side. The agricultural community and the barging community see, see the dams from the opposite perspective. If you take the lower snake down, you know, what's next? We've got to get beyond that to what the larger central issue is, here is. And the issue is whether this region wants to improve the quality of the water in the, Willamette, in the, in the Columbia River and, and, and maintain this tremendous icon and symbol of the Pacific Northwest. There's a couple ways to do it, and there's price tags. And we need to get to a point where we can say, okay, here are the three alternatives. They cost this much, this much, and this much. Let's pick one, and let's put the resources back, back of it to do it. I'm not invested in taking the dams out or leaving them in. I'm invested in making some choices and moving ahead with a decision and stopping this game, which I think the federal government's engaged in, sort of kicking this can down the road, certainly past November of this year, uh, and not really getting on with it. And I'll be saying more about that later. Good afternoon. Diane Lynn, Multnomah County Commissioner Member, City Club. Uh, thank you so much for your help in sustaining the Covering Kids, the insurance uh, outreach program uh, for homeless youth downtown. It's wonderful. And thank you for your choice for Secretary of State, Bill Bradbury. I think it's an excellent choice. Um, my very brief question is, we're terribly concerned about the crisis of mental health, uh, especially in here in Multnomah County, and uh, I know you have a plan to get together a task force. Just quick thoughts about the mental health crisis in mental health system. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very real, and in fact, um, one of the efforts that we, uh, attempt, we've attempted to do in the last budget is try to increase resources and slots for a variety of uh, mental health problems. It is at the root of a whole lot of what's happening in our criminal justice system, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the reality here, it's like, it's sort of similar to the fact that if you don't give people health insurance coverage, they get in somewhere later, and it costs us a lot more. Uh, if you don't deal with people's mental health issues, they'll end up in the criminal justice system or they'll end up on the street or somewhere else and we'll still pay for them. And, you know, we as a society uh, really need to begin to step back and, and, and start putting those resources on the front end. It, you know, it's, it's, it's always hard to do. It's, uh, it's like the, the choice between, you've heard me say this before, investing in prenatal care or resuscitating 500 gram infants in a neonatal intensive care unit. You know, the political and emotional imperative drives the money into the hospital and then you create more low birth weight infants. So I think we need to continue to have a very high level public dialogue about this. This isn't just about sort of the humane aspect of a, of a civilized society dealing with a disadvantaged group of its population. It's about the big picture. It impacts our ability to educate kids, our criminal justice system, the homeless issue, and a whole host of other things. And uh, we simply need to begin to come to terms with that. 